today I was going to read The Remembrance of Samuel Johnson, but I thought it was kind of dry, and there wasn't a lot much of a plot line. There was really nothing fantastic about the story that we're told beyond the fact that the narrator is 228 years old. So, that story is a satire where H.P. Lovecraft makes fun of himself and the literary society of his day. So instead, I am going to read Sweet Ermengarde. This one is a parody of romantic melodrama rather than anything related to horror or science fiction. And I am reading it on my computer because it's easier than dealing with this. Sweet Ermengarde, or The Heart of a Country Girl. Chapter 1. A Simple Rustic Maid. Ermengarde Stubbs was the, was the beauteous blonde daughter of Hiram Stubbs, a poor but honest farmer bootlegger of Hogton, Vermont. Her name was originally Ethel Ermengarde, but her father persuaded her to drop the praenomen after the passage of the 18th Amendment, averring that it made him thirsty by reminding him of ethyl alcohol, C2 H5OH. His own products contained mostly methyl or wood alcohol, CH. OH. Ermengarde confessed to 16 summers and branded as mendacious all reports to the effect that she was 30. She had large black eyes, a prominent Roman nose, light hair which was never dark at the roots, except when the local drugstore was short on supplies, and a beautiful but inexpensive complexion. She was about 5 foot 5.33 inches tall, weighed 115.47 pounds on her father's corn scales, also off them and was adjudged most lovely by all the village swains who admired her father's farm and liked his liquid crops. Ermengarde's hand was sought in matrimony by two ardent lovers. Squire Hardman, who had, who had a mortgage on the old home, was very rich and elderly. He was dark and cruelly handsome, and always rode horseback and carried a riding crop. Long had he sought the radiant Ermengarde, and now his ardor was fanned to fever heat by a secret known to him alone, for upon the humble acres of farmer Stubbs, he had discovered a rain vein of rich gold. Aha, said he, I will win the maiden ere her parent knows of his unsuspected wealth, and join to my fortune a greater fortune still. And so he began to call twice a week instead of once as before. But alas, for the sinister designs of a villain, Squire Hardman was not the only suitor for the fair one. Close by the village dwelt another, the handsome Jack Manley, whose curly yellow hair had won the sweet Ermengarde's affection when both were toddling youngsters at the village school. Jack had long been too bashful to declare his passion, but one day, while strolling along a shady lane by the old mill with Ermengarde, he had found courage to utter that which was within his heart. O oh, light of my life, said he, my soul is so overburdened that I must speak. Ermengarde, my ideal, he pronounced it ideal. Life has become an empty thing without you, beloved of my spirit. Behold, a supplicant kneeling in the dust before thee. Ermengarde, O oh, Ermengarde, raise me to a heaven of joy and say that you may one day be mine. It is true that I am poor, but I have not youth and strength to fight my way to fame. This I can do only for you, dear Ethel, pardon me, Ermengarde, my only, my most precious. Here he paused to wipe his eyes and mop his brow, and the fair responded, Jack, my angel, at last. I mean, this is so unexpected and quite unprecedented. I never dreamed that you entertained such sentiments of affection in connection with one so lovely, lowly as Farmer Stubb's child, for I am still but a child. Such is your natural nobility that I had feared, I mean thought, that you would be blind to such slight charms as I possess, and that you would seek your fortune in the great city, there meeting and wedding one of the more comely damsels, whose splendor we observe in fashion books. But Jack, since, since it is really I whom you adore, let us waive all needless circumlocution. Jack, my darling, my heart has long been susceptible to your manly graces. I cherish an affection for thee. Consider me thine own, and be sure to buy the ring at Perkins' hardware store, where they have such nice imitation diamonds in the window. Ermengarde, my love! Jack, my precious! My darling, my own! 
my God. Curtain. Chapter two, and the villain still pursued her. But these tender passages, sacred though their fervor, did not pass unobserved by profane eyes, were crouched in the bushes and gritting his teeth was the dastardly Squire Hardman. When the lovers had finally strolled away, he leapt out into the lane, viciously twirling his mustache and riding crop and kicking an unquestionably innocent cat who was also out strolling. Curses, he cried. Hardman, not the cat. I am foiled in my plot to get the farm and the girl, but Jack Manley shall never succeed. I am a man of power, and we shall see. Thereupon he repaired to the humble Stubbs cottage, where he found the fond father in the still cellar, washing bottles under the supervision of the gentle wife and mother, Hannah Stubbs. Coming directly to the point, the villain spoke. Farmer Stubbs, I cherish a tender affection of long standing for your lovely offspring, Ethel Ermengarde. I am consumed with love and wish her hand in matrimony. Always a man of few words, I will not descend to euphemism. Give me the girl, or I will foreclose the mortgage and take the old home. But, sir, pleaded the distracted Stubbs while his stricken spouse merely glowered, I'm sure the child's affections are elsewhere placed. She must be mine, sternly snapped the sinister squire. I will make her love me. None shall resist my will. Either she becomes my wife, or the old homestead goes. And with a sneer and a flick of his riding crop, Squire Hardman strode out into the night. Scarce had he departed when there entered by the back door the radiant lovers, eager to tell the senior Stubbses and of their newfound happiness. Imagine the universal consternation which reigned when all was known. Tears flowed like white ale, till suddenly Jack remembered he was the hero, and raised his head, declaiming in appropriately virile accents. Never shall the fair Ermengarde be offered up to this beast as a sacrifice while I live. I shall protect her. She is mine, 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 and then some. Fear not, dear father and mother to be. I will protect her. I will defend you all. You shall have the old home still. Adverb not noun, though Jack was by no means of sympathy with the Stubbs kind of farm produce. And I shall lead to the altar the beauteous Ermengarde, loveliest of her sex to perdition with the cruel squire and his ill-gotten gold. The right shall always win, and a hero is always in the right. I will go to the great city and make a fortune to save you the, to save you all ere the mortgage fall due. Farewell, my love, I leave you now in tears, but I shall return to pay off the mortgage and claim you as my bride. Jack, my protector, Ermin, my tootsie roll, dearest darling, and don't forget that ring at Perkins. Oh. Ah. <laughs> Curtain. Chapter 3. A Dastardly Act But the resourceful Squire Hardman was not so easily to be foiled. Close by the village lay a disreputable settlement of unkempt shacks, populated by a shiftless scum who lived by thieving and other odd jobs. Here the devilish villain secured two accomplices, ill-favored fellows who were very clearly no gentlemen. And in the night, the evil three broke into the Stubbs' cottage and abducted the fair Ermengarde, taking her to a wretched hovel in the settlement and placing her under the charge of Mother Maria, a hideous old hag. Farmer Stubbs was quite distracted and would have advertised in the papers if the cost had been less than a cent a word for each insertion. Ermengarde was firm and never wavered in her, her refusal to wed the villain. Aha, my proud beauty, quoth he. I have you in my power, and sooner or later I will break that will of thine. Meanwhile, think of your poor old father and mother as turned out of hearth and home and wandering, helpless through the meadows. Oh, spare them, spare them, said the maiden. Never, ha 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 ha, leered the brute. And so the cruel days sped on, while in all, all in ignorance young Jack Manley was seeking fame and fortune in the great city. Chapter 5. Subtle Villainy one day, as Squire Hardman sat in the front parlor of his expensive and palatial home, indulging in his favorite pastime of gnashing his teeth and swirling his riding crop, a great thought came to him, and he cursed aloud at the statue of Satan on the onyx mantelpiece. "'Fool that I am!' he cried. "'Why did I ever waste all this trouble on the girl when I can get the farm by simply foreclosing?' "'I never thought of that. 
I will let the girl go, take the farm, and be free to wed some fair city maid like the leading lady of that burlesque troupe which played last week at the town hall. And so he went down to the settlement, apologized to Ermengarde, let her go home, and went home himself to plot new crimes and invent new modes of villainy. The days wore on, and the Stubbses grew very sad over the coming loss of their home, and still, but nobody seemed able to do anything about it. One day, a party of hunters from the city chanced to stray over the old farm, and one of them found the gold. Hiding his discovery from his companions, he feigned rattlesnake bite and went to the Stubbses' cottage for aid of the usual kind. Ermengarde opened the door and saw him. He also saw her, and in that moment resolved to win her and the gold. "'For my old mother's sake, I must,' he cried loudly to himself. "'No sacrifice is too great!' Chapter 5 the city chap. Algernon Reginald Jones was a polished man of the world from the great city, and in his sophisticated hands, our poor little Ermengarde was an, as a mere child. One could almost believe that sixteen-year-old stuff. Algy was a fast worker, but never crude. He could have taught Hardman a thing or two about finesse in shaking. Shaking. <laughs> Thus, only a week after his advent to the Stubbs' family circle, where he looked like the vile serpent that he was, he had persuaded the heroine to elope. He was in the night that she went, leaving a note for her parents, sniffing the familiar mash for the last time and kissing the cat goodbye. Touching stuff. On the train, Algernon became sleepy and slumped down in his seat, allowing a paper to fall out of his pocket by accident. Ermengarde, taking advantage of her supposed position as a bright elect, picked up the folded sheet and read its perfumed expanse, when, lo, she almost fainted. It was a love letter from another woman. Perfidious deceiver, she whispered at the sleeping, Al sleeping Algernon. So this is all that your boasted fidelity amounts to. I'm done with you for all eternity. So saying, she pushed him out the window and settled down for much-needed rest. Chapter 6, Alone in the Great City when the noisy train pulled into the dark station at the city, poor helpless Ermengarde was all alone, without the money to get back to Hogden. Oh, why, she sighed in innocent regret, didn't I take his pocketbook before I pushed him out? Oh, well. I should worry. He told me all about the city so I can easily earn enough to get home, if not pay off the mortgage. But alas for our little heroine, work is not easy for a greenhorn to secure, so for a week she was forced to sleep on park benches and to obtain food from the breadline. Once a wily and wicked person perceived her helplessness, offered her a position as dishwasher in a fashionable and depraved cabaret. But our heroine was true to her rustic ideals and refused to work in such a gilded and glittering place of frivolity, especially since she was offered only three dollars per week with meals, but no board. She tried to look up Jack Manley, her one-time lover, but he was nowhere to be found. Perchance, too, he would not have known her, for in poverty she had perforce become a brunette again, and Jack had not beheld her in that state since school days. One day she found a neat but costly purse in the park, and after seeing that there was not much in it, she took it to the rich lady whose card proclaimed her ownership. Delighted beyond words at the honesty of this forlorn waif, the aristocratic Mrs. Van Itty, adopted Ermengarde to replace the little one who had been stolen from her so many years ago. How like my precious Maud, she sighed. She watched the fair brunette return to blondness. And so several weeks passed, with the old folks at home tearing their hair and the wicked square Hardman chuckled, chuckling devilishly. Chapter 7 Happily Ever Afterward One day, the wealthy heiress Ermengarde S. Van Itty hired and hired a new second assistant chauffeur. Struck by something familiar in his face, she looked again and gasped. Lo, it was none other than the perfidious Algernon Reginald Jones, whom she had pushed from a car window on that fateful day. He had survived. This much was almost immediately evident. Also, he had wed the other woman, who, who had run away with the milkman and all the money in the house. Now wholly humbly, humbled, he asked forgiveness of our heroine and confided to her the whole tale of the gold on her father's farm. 
Moved beyond words, he raised his salary a dollar a month and resolved to gratify at last that always unquenchable anxiety to relieve the worry of the old folks. So one bright day, Ermengarde motored back to Hogden and arrived at the farm just as Squire Hardman was foreclosing the mortgage and ordering the old books out. Stay, villain, she cried, flashing a colossal roll of bills. You are foiled at last. Here's your money. Go now and never darken our humble door again. Then followed a joyous reunion, whilst the squire twisted his moustache and riding crop in, in bafflement and dismay. But hark, what is that? Footsteps sound on the old gravel walk, and who should appear but our hero, Jack Manley, worn and seedy but radiant of face. See, seeking at once the downcast villain, he said, Squire, lend me a ten spot, will you? I have just come back from the city with my beauteous bride, the fair Bridget Goldstein, and need something to start things on the old farm. Then turning to the Stubbses, he apologized for his inability to pay off the mortgage as agreed. Don't mention it, said Ermengarde. Prosperity has come to us, and I will consider it sufficient payment if you will forget forever the foolish fancies of our childhood. All this time, Mrs. Van Itty had been sitting in the motor waiting for Ermengarde, but as she lazily eyed the sharp-faced Hannah Stubbs, a vague memory started from the back of her brain. Then it all came to her, and she shrieked accusingly at the agrestic matron. You! You! Hannah Smith, I know you now! Twenty-eight years ago, you were my baby Maud's nurse and stole her, stole her from the cradle. Where, oh, where is my child? Then a thought came as the lightning in a murky sky. Ermengarde, you see, she is your daughter. She's mine. Fate has restored to me my old child, my little Maud. Ermengarde, Maud, come to your mother's loving arms. But Ermengarde was doing some tall thinking. How could she get away with the 16-year-old stuff if she had been stolen 28 years ago? And if she was not Stubbs' daughter, the gold would never be hers. Mrs. Van Itty was rich, but Square Hardman was richer. So approaching the de dejected villain, she inflicted upon him the last terrible punishment. Squire, dear, she murmured, I've reconsidered all. I love you and your naive strength. Marry me at once, or I will have you prosecuted for that kidnapping last year. Foreclose your mortgage and enjoy with me the gold your cleverness discovered. Come, dear. And the poor dub did. The end. Since this is shorter than I expected, I'm going to read another one but in a separate video.